transforming our energy economy is going to lead to energy independence, and maybe they're skeptical about how many jobs it's going to create. Um, but this is, this is a really key factor. You can see amongst opponents, there's still concerns about marine life. Um, and uh, we would, you know, again, this shows that there, there still needs to be further education on the issue of the impacts of marine life and on the notion of comparative impacts. Again, there are no free lunches. We're going to get our energy from somewhere, and we really need to think about these in a comparative sense. you have a question here? From the European example, though, what kinds of negative impacts of the marine life and environment have been um, You know, the very, very minimal on avian. It's mostly habitat displacement more than, than bird strikes. So the birds can see 10 miles away or so. They can start to see the wind farm, and they start to deflect. Almost all of the... The, the birds fly around the wind turbines. A few get struck, but um, there are, when in, with conventional technology, you, you put a monopile and you drill down and you, and you put it into the sea floor, uh, and that will cause a lot of noise, and so you need to time that right. And if, you, if you're in an area that is a, a habitat area for marine mammals, uh, they're going to temporarily vacate, and they have found for a season or two, it took a season or two for um, uh, uh, some dolphins and, and porpoise to come back. There are not great whales in the North Sea, and so that's one of the things that we, we you know, we've got a lot of great whales in, uh, off the Atlantic. We've got some here in Hawaii. Uh, and that's certainly one thing that we're going to have to be, be sensitive to. Uh, while the, the wind turbine is operator, it, there are some vibrations that go through down through the, uh, the wind turbine, but compared to the commercial shipping, uh, particularly on the, the Atlantic coast, uh, we would not expect that to be much of an impact. If anything, they will probably have a positive effect on fisheries through an artificial reef, uh, but they haven't seen that much benefit, but it's probably at best neutral. Overall, we think the wildlife impacts are, are, are small, and certainly compared to anything else that's out there, uh, even excluding climate change, they're going to be small. There is no entrainment or mortality like you get at any kind of power plant or, or, or dam. Uh, there's no discharge of cooling water. There's no mining of, of coal. Um, so we, we would say that the impacts on comparative basis are, are quite small. So this looks at why did people shift? So um, we asked people if they shifted, and if so, what made them shift from the earlier survey? Um, and again, you can see uh, th this is self-identified reasons. Oh, excuse me. This is looking at 2003 versus 2009. I mean, 2005 versus 2009, and you can see. Uh, People have, energy independent has really moved to the fore from where it was uh, four or five years ago. I guess not all that surprising with the huge spike uh, in 2008. And you know, this is even after the crash, but one of the, the real selling points in Delaware for offshore wind was price stability. People like, as much as they like to pay a low price, they like to pay a stable price, you can budget for it. Companies like it, citizens like it, no one likes to, not know whether uh, your winter heating bill, you know, I have, I have an oil, home, I use home heating oil, you know, is, is my winter bill going to be $1,500 or $5,000? And, and I don't quite know where, where it's going to fall uh, in that range. Um, and it's a bit of a gamble. Uh, and so things like price stability are, are important. You can see that um, aesthetics dropped off. I think people initially were real concerned in Cape Cod about aesthetics, uh, and, and, and Delaware too. Um, you see aesthetics in Cape Cod was stable, but what really moved up was more fishing and boating. People, and, and part of it was the, the arguments that the, the opposition in Cape Cod were making was that this was going to impact the fishing and the boating. They, they sort of lost the aesthetic argument to a certain extent, other than amongst a very few. Uh, and instead, this is, became more of a, a user competition uh, issue. 
Um, so here we have the slide. Why, why did people switch? Um, and uh, you, know, you see, you know, obviously some similarity in between the, the top two issues. Uh, energy independence, again, really important. Some people became much more concerned about energy independence and switched towards support. Uh, and a, a lot of opponents, I mean, this, this was a uh, self-identified reason. This was a fill in the blank. Um, and so the answers are a little vague, but we would interpret this. It, it's probably some combination of people wanting, liking it because of the price stable notion. And it's some people thinking that it might be cheaper. You know, which is probably is misinformed in the near term, not necessarily the long term view of, of 20 years from now, but in the near term. Yeah. I have a question about your story, a question about energy independence. Yeah. Did you ask whether or not a particular wind project is the same for the Chicago helps people achieve energy independence, or uh, whether or not the uh, US nationwide large scale adoption of wind power? Um, we asked why they supported this project. Now, obviously, one individual project is not going to lead to energy independence. We, and, and I'm going to hold off. I think I've got a slide about where we asked about a larger policy, but if not, I'll come back to it. Um, uh, but that's a, it's, a, it's a good question, you know, and it, it is obviously it's somewhat difficult for people to under and maybe people that's why they don't understand the linkage between the wind farm and climate change uh, is they don't understand that we're not ultimately we're not talking about one wind farm a one-off uh, but we're talking about really a transformative energy economy which would include land-based wind offshore wind uh, solar thermal geothermal uh, biofuels all everything uh, so we also want to know why, why did people who at one time supported now uh, opposed? And you can see uh, we have electric rates. And, and that's because people then got an understanding that initially they're going to have to pay more. Uh, and people don't necessarily like to pay more. Uh, and we, again, see some commonality between, between the, you know, the top three are, are identical concerns about marine life uh, and some concerns about Aesthetics. So, yeah. Probably a simple answer for this, but uh, if aesthetics have been kind of an ongoing, even a global concern, why not pay them pay straight like any other customer? Um. Yeah, I, I, I don't know why people haven't painted. Them. I did just read a, a, a study where they, they on land they painted them a whole bunch of series of colors to try and find out what would be least attractive to insects, <laughs> thinking they could keep away the bats, and they picked, they ended up with purple. I don't know how purple would go over with uh, the public, but your, your question is a good one. So now we're talking about the climate change, because again, we had some differences. Uh, we did find that, you know, again, we asked people their top three, so they, these percentages overall ended up to to be 100%. So 24% of people in Cape Cod and 19 in Delaware identified as one of their top three reasons uh, for supporting uh, their, that offshore wind project. But in each area, it represents a relatively low priority. It may be the sixth or seventh most popular reason. Um, and here's the slide which shows you the difference. Will the project have this effect? And you can see significantly, I mean, here in Delaware, more than twice as many people think it's going to lead to energy independence than reduce climate change. Uh, and so uh, there is a, a, a real misunderstanding of, of, of wind energy and climate change. But interestingly, uh, again, a third think the project will help reduce climate change, and almost half we asked this other question, do you think you should take steps now to address climate change, even if it involves significant costs? Uh, and then about 45% say yes. Um, and we did find, if you're aware of the connection between wind power and climate change, and you're concerned about climate change, that we think you should take steps now, then you're significantly more likely to support the project. So my take home here is, Enhanced climate literacy is likely to influence 
public perceptions in support of, of renewable energy. Um, people don't really seem to understand the connections between the two. Yeah. Can you do partially because uh, I'm not, uh, what you say is, I'm asking if it's because climate change might be a global, more global problem or it comes from global region and the uh, energy um, security or energy dependency is international. So maybe part of that is because they think having such projects in the US is more in favor of energy independence. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that's a good, a good theory. I'm not, I, I can't say whether it's correct or not, but certainly the U.S. could become energy independent, um, and if the rest of the world continues to burn fossil fuel, we're still going to have a climate change problem. So uh, that, that could explain it. It could be that uh, people are just not that concerned about climate change. They don't see it impacting their lives right now, but um, they do see being dependent uh, on other countries for their energy supply impacting their lives right now. So some of it could be uh, concern about themselves versus uh, generations way down the line and, and, and less concern about people on, on you know, low-lying uh, states like Bangladesh or uh, islands. <coughs> so the, this what we did here, and this is from our 2006 survey, we did more complex modeling. We, did, we made 25 different versions of this survey. Um, and what we tried to do is uh, understand how people tr make trade-offs of distance uh, and price, and, and to a certain extent, we wanted to find location. And so the questions ultimately look like this. Uh, we gave them two different packages of offshore wind projects and then the, the no option of expansion of coal or natural gas. Basically about 99% of the generation in Delaware is coal or natural gas, so that's sort of our status quo option. This comes out of marketing research, um, uh, choice modeling. Um, I like to, to say when you, when you buy a tube of toothpaste, you're not buying a tube of toothpaste. That's not why you're choosing it. And that's not the way marketers think about it. They think about the characteristics of the good. And the characteristics of toothpaste are whether it has a squeezable tube or whether it stands up, whether it's a paste or a gel, whether it's striped or not, whether it's minty or, or cinnamony, or uh, all of these different attributes is what people are buying. Um, and that's what they're selling you. They're not selling you toothpaste. Uh, and so that's what we, we do here. We isolate the characteristics to find out what people think about wind farms. So this is first just a simple analysis. Um, if the initial price of the wind is the same as the initial price of coal or natural gas, we had 95% of the people in Delaware preferred wind power. Pretty striking. But even more striking is we, we did ask them, well, would you be willing to pay more for for three years, one to thirty dollars per month on your electric bill, uh, and with that range, we still get ninety-one percent. Uh, we'd rather have. You can see, in my state, the issue is not so much social acceptance of wind, but it's that coal, really, is no longer socially acceptable in Delaware. Um, so this is now the complex modeling, and, and this is again, this this is the ocean area. These, these people here lived about a little over half a mile from the beach. Uh, the inland, to a certain extent, is a proxy for the whole state because uh, it's about 95% of the sample. Uh, when, you, when you look at the whole, if you put everything together, it basically is not any different than the inland. And then these are the people who live by Delaware Bay. Uh, and what's interesting is these curves all basically break at the same spot. The people who live on the ocean are willing to pay more, and it takes a little more time to get them to zero. But there's a difference between 